Ready? Okay, welcome to our what would normally be our Sunday night Bible study in Revelation. Uh, would encourage you to turn to Revelation 2, 12 through 17, and we'll take a look at another one of the churches that Jesus speaks to in these two chapters uh, at the beginning of his revelation of end time events. Let's bow for prayer as we begin. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to meet together once again and to learn from what you say to these seven churches, what your attitude is about specific things within churches, some good, some bad. We pray as we walk through these seven churches and the study that we're doing on them, they will encourage us and challenge us to be the kind of church and challenge us as individuals to be the kind of people that are, that are promoting our church to be what Christ wants it to be. And we'll thank you for it. In your name we pray. <clears throat> so in Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17, we meet another church that uh, Jesus wrote a letter to. This is the church at Pergamos. This church is typically coined the compromising church. So let's just read the account, beginning with verse 12 of Revelation chapter 2, and I'm reading to you out of a New King James Version. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So let me begin, just for introduction, by giving you just a little background about the city itself and the church that was there. This particular city, Pergamos, was located about 100 miles north of Ephesus, with Smyrna located halfway in between. It sat about 15 miles east of the Aegean Sea, really wasn't located on any major trade route at all. In 95 AD, it had been the capital of Asia Minor for over 250 years. <clears throat> and if you go there today, it's the Turkish city of Bergama. It sat on a large hill, a thousand feet above a plain, which from a distance gave it a very majestic look. It had a large university there with 200,000 volumes in its library that was second in size only to Alexandria in Egypt. And it became known as the place where parchment was made, which was paper that was made from treated animal skins. This city was a main center of worship to the main deities of the Greek Roman world. They had temples that were dedicated to four main gods Athena, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Zeus. And overshadowing all of those, there was tremendous pagan worship for the emperor who was in power at whatever time. So this city became the center of emperor worship in the province of Asia. This passage is the only information that we have from the New Testament about this church. Paul went through this area on his second missionary journey. So this church, like the church at Smyrna, may also have just sprouted out of the ministry that Jesus had in Ephesus. So the text divides Christ's message to this church into five main points. So let's begin walking through those. In verse 12, you find the first main point which is how Christ characterized himself to this church. Keep in mind, 
that each unique way Jesus identified himself to these churches has to do with the spiritual situation and condition that the church was in that he was addressing. As Jesus addresses this church, notice that he calls himself he who has the sharp two-edged sword. In verse 16, this sword is the sword of his mouth. Hebrews 4.12 describes the sword as God's word. And the Bible, of course, uh, as you know, shows us that there are three main things that God uses his word for in people's lives. First of all, obviously, God uses his word as a tool to bring people to salvation. Hebrews 4.12 says God wor God's word discerns our thoughts and the intents of our heart to convict sinners and to bring salvation. 1 Peter 1.23 says we are born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. James 1.18 says that God of his own will brought us forth <clears throat> by the word of truth. So God's word is the Holy Spirit's tool to bring conviction and confession to save lost sinners. God's word is also used to grow believers. We find this in Psalm 119, 105. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And the Bible says God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path to teach us truth and to guide us and to grow our life. That's an obvious uh, truth that most Christians know. But thirdly, understand this. God's word is also Christ's weapon of judgment. We saw this in chapter 1, verse 16, where Christ is coming to deal with these churches according to God's word. If you go to Revelation 19, verse 11, verse 15, verse 21, Christ is coming back there to judge the world, and he will have this sword with him coming out of his mouth, the sword of judgment. In regard to this sinful compromising church, keep in mind, that when Jesus called himself this, this was not a pleasant greeting for them. In verse 16, he says he is coming to fight against them. It's Christ's intention here to show this church that he's about to use his word to separate them from their sin. And if they will not comply, he's going to use his word to punish them for their sin. Jesus is reminding them that he saved them from sin's penalty and he expects them to be separated in their life from sin's practice. Simply put, we all understand that Christians are to live holy lives. And this church had tolerated sin in the lives of its people to the point where it basically became common and normal for many of them to live in sin so much so that this is what characterized many in the church. So some application for us today is this. They are a picture of churches that don't identify or preach against sin. They don't confront sin. They rather accept sin. They allow the practice of sin just as if it's normal. And his message to them is, if they don't turn from sin and return to growing righteous living, Christ is going to chasten this church and especially the compromise. Balaam's doctrine was compromise is good. His attitude was we as God's people should learn to get along with the world and be like the world. Okay, And there are two things that Jesus condemned them for compromising with. First of all in the text it tells us that Jesus condemned them for eating idle meat. Now, a little explanation. It's important to note in their pagan world that all social events were tied to idolatry, unlike the secular world we live in today. So basically, when you lived in their society, pagan Greek society, any kind of feast, any kind of celebration that you went to all the food was dedicated to a pagan god. And if you went to those celebrations and ate that food at the event, that basically meant to the pagans that you were actually worshiping that god. Although there was nothing wrong with the food itself, and Christians didn't have to worship the pagan god in their heart as they were eating a steak, 
it appeared to the pagans that this is exactly what they were doing. So Jesus condemned them for thinking it was to, uh, acceptable to participate in those kinds of things, maybe not wrong in and of themselves, but things that associated them with the world's sins in the minds of the lost. Think about that a little bit. Because sometimes in our society, we may be confronted with doing certain things that may not be wrong in themselves, but we have to ask ourselves the question, how do the lost view this in my life? Do they view it as sin, even though it may not actually be sin? And this was the issue about eating meat that had been offered to an idol. Secondly, he condemned them for the sexual sin that was practiced at many pagan events. Again, let me remind you that in the Greco-Roman world, with all the paganism that, that had infiltrated over hundreds of years and permeated and overtook Roman society, remember that all social events were tied to idolatry. Okay, For instance, if you went to a wedding, a holiday feast, a sports event, an entertainment event, all of those would be started or include the act of worshiping the God that the event was dedicated to. And within the ceremonies or feasts, for instance, if you went to a wedding or some kind of a thing where there was a feast that took place and a program that took place, this would include practicing sexual immorality that went with the pagan worship. Understand that most all pagan worship in that day and age, the temples employed pagan, uh, wicked prostitutes, male and female. And part of their worship often was involving yourself with those prostitutes because they believed the ecstasy you reached through having sexual contact with them was actually proof that you had actually communicated and communed with the pagan god that that temple was all about. The, the, the ungodliness that existed in that wicked society was far beyond anything that we really understand in our day and age. All right. So in the ceremonies of the feast, the sexual immorality was there that went right along with the pagan worship. Let me give you an illustration, okay? Let's say, for instance, you're living in Pergamos, and you have a neighbor, and his daughter's going to get married. And you get invited because you're a good friend of your neighbor. You're invited to the ceremony. So at the ceremony, there would be the, uh, a pagan god that the ceremony was dedicated to. And at the reception afterward, uh, that would include sexual acts of some sort, possibly, for you to be involved in if you chose to. And keep in mind, understand this, uh, it fluctuated some, but if you attended those ceremonies and you did not participate in the little act of worshiping the God and then did not participate in the sexual activity that followed during the reception, that was often viewed as a slap in the face to the host and to the God that the ceremony was dedicated to. This gives you some idea of the dilemma that Christians were involved with living in such wicked pagan societies. So here's just a summary of what had happened in the Pergamos church. Basically, many believers had slid back in to their formal sinful lifestyle and had begun again to participate in those pagan events and the worship and the sexual sin that went along with it. Their close association with sinners and their sin brought them to actually practice that sin. And above that, keep in mind, here's the real critical issue. Both of those are critical issues for the Lord. But along with that, here's another critical issue. Those people in the church that had begun again to practice those sins, they were just like Balaam who put a stumbling block in the path of the Jews those who were sinning deliberately promoted it to others within the church. The Christians in that church who were practicing those sins not only practiced them, 
but promoted them among the other believers in the church. Now, just to apply, <clears throat> let me kind of put this down on a level where we can understand it in our society. <clears throat> we live in America. We have many things in common with the world because we live in the world. We live in the same kind of houses they do. We drive the same kind of cars that they do. We can go to ball games, movies, concerts, weddings, family reunions, holiday celebrations, and on and on and on and on, and never worry about having to be forced or expected to commit sin while doing that, okay? But we also have to be careful to differentiate between what is amoral in our society and what is immoral. We can enjoy a lot of things in society that are not religious or moral in nature, but if they promote sin and they violate righteousness as God's children, we're to be careful to separate ourselves from those things. One writer said this, when what violates godly character and righteousness becomes our admiration and preoccupation, we have become worldly. That admiration will soon lead us to the practice of of sin. And scripture warns about this, man, all over the place. Romans 12, remember what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, where it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in Titus 2, verses uh, 12 through 14, also uh, it says this, and from verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Those are just a few of many samples. So he criticized them for following the doctrine of Balaam. Secondly, he also criticized them for having in their church the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which we saw before in one of the previous churches. And just to, to remind us, the Nicolaitans were a false uh, Christian group founded by a man named Nicholas, who was actually one of the original deacons in Acts chapter 6. And what Nicholas believed and promoted was, he believed that spiritual freedom from sin equaled the freedom to sin. Since sin was all forgiven, well, we might as well enjoy it while we can. And this further motivated the sin being committed by the people in the Pergamus church because it gave them a doctrinal excuse to hang their sin on and to commit and enjoy sin. So to sum up, this church tolerated living in open compromise with pagan ritual and sexual sin, and this church tolerated those who lived their lives for selfish and sinful pleasures. And when the church loses its holiness, it loses its legitimacy and its impact. We need to understand that and know that. A sinful church cannot be a light for the truth it violates, and it cannot be a light of righteousness that it refuses to practice. And the New Testament church needed to understand that, and our modern-day church needs to understand it as well. And I want to make this point here, and we'll see it more as we look at some of the other churches. Notice the specific sin that Jesus is angry about is sexual sin. You look at America today, and in the last 40 years, things have changed a lot. Our society now takes sexual sin about as lightly as it can. In fact, most don't even think of it as sin. They just think of it as a person's own personal preference. But if you think sexual sin is not a big deal to the Lord, you need to take another look at God's Word and see what it says. Because 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says this, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. People who live those lifestyles prove they do not belong to God and they will not make heaven. While we have Christian churches all over our country now that are fully open to embrace sexual sin without thinking that it is anything at all. The Bible gives us a much different picture. Here's the fourth main point in verse 16. And this is about what Christ commanded them. And he commands them very simply. He says, repent. Repent. Christ simply demands that those living in sin, excusing their compromising attitudes and sinful practices to get along with the world, he demands they come back to live wholly separated lives. Christ also demands this church repent for tolerating sinful believers. Okay, Notice verse 14. Pay attention to this. Notice in verse 14, Jesus says, I have a few things against you, the church, because you have them those who are in regular sin. Then in verse 16 he says, I will come to you and I will fight against them. One reason Christ was angry with this church was that they testified for Christ without purifying the church that was supposed to be representing Christ's holy character. And Jesus warned that if they do not discipline these sinning believers, the Lord is going to. And keep in mind, folks, the New Testament church's responsibility, both then and today, is to confront sinning believers in the church. Confronting sinning believers in ongoing sin is the most loving thing that we can do for three reasons. First of all, because it spares that believer future chastening from God. Second, because it spares the church the grief of having to watch one of its people be chastened by God. Notice that this church does not, does not comply. If this church does not comply, the Lord is going to fight against them. This is exactly what the Lord did in the church at Corinth as he killed some and made others sick because they were severely violating holy living. They were not living in love. And so Christ dealt with many in that church to chasten them for their sin. The third reason that confronting believers is the most loving thing we can do is because it can reveal that those who are sinning are actually phonies who have never really repented, never turned from their sin, which at least can open their eyes to understand where they really stand with God. And folks, let me just tell you this. We have a whole bunch of people frequenting a whole bunch of Christian churches, so-called, in our society today, who live in consistent and regular sin, and they're deceived into thinking that they know God because their sin is just tolerated as being okay. That is not to be the case in the New Testament church. John MacArthur said this, The church's purpose is not to provide a place for sinning believers or unrepentant sinners to feel comfortable. Error and sin will never be suppressed by compromising with it. It's Christians and church's responsibility for us to stand for purity both in our own lives and in the body of the church. All right? So here's the final point in verse 17. And this is how Christ consoled the genuine believers that were there. Again, Christ promises rewards for those who overcome, those who repent, those who embrace the truth, and the righteousness that it will produce in their lives. And here's what he promises them. First of all, he says the overcomers get to eat hidden manna. Notice Christ's pun here. He essentially is saying to them, if you repent of eating idle food and following the sin it promotes, I will give you my food to eat. Manna, of course, we know, was the honey-flavored bread that God fed the Jews in the wilderness with that represented Christ, who is the bread of life, who has come down from heaven to give us the bread of life of salvation. 
That manna refers to all the spiritual blessings that we enjoy for faithfully living for the Lord. John Phillips made this comment about that. He said, the hidden manna is a symbol of the overcomer feasting on Christ in the hidden place that the world cannot see. The world prefers its own banquet of sin to feed their carnal appetite, which insults the living God. But the saint of God desires to be alone with the Lord, enjoying his spiritual food. Secondly, he gives this blessing to the overcomers. He says the overcomers get a white stone with a new name on it. So what is this all about? Well, it made a lot of sense to them in their day. I give you three illustrations. This white stone could represent the gift of eternal life. Some believe that this was a diamond, which is the most precious of all stones, and it symbolizes God's ultimate precious gift of eternal life. But in their society, this white stone could picture our reservation that we have in heaven. In the Roman world, if you received a white stone, basically uh, if you were going to some kind of a feast, your ticket would be a white stone with your name on it. Also, in the Roman world, if an athlete won a particular event, they were given a white stone with their name on it, which was their ticket to the awards banquet. So for those who overcome sin, God gives us a stone that, in a sense, pictures our reservation in heaven. Third, the white stone also represents our identification as Christ's precious child. In the Old Testament, the high priest wore 12 stones on his vest, each with the name of one of the tribes, which symbolized that the 12 tribes belong to God. Those born again are going to receive a white stone to represent that we belong to God. And on that stone, this says that there will, we will have our own secret name. It's interesting to me, if you compare this with what the Bible says, Interesting to me that God names all the stars. He knows each one of them by name. And in heaven, we're going to be his stars, given a special nickname that's only known to us and the Lord that will picture how individually precious we are to the Lord Jesus Christ. So just to conclude, we need to understand this, that one of the biggest problems that many of these churches had in the New Testament and in the second century, as time went on, was that the sin of the wicked pagan societies they lived in often infiltrated the church. And they many times had a difficult time dealing with them and sometimes did not deal with them at all. And we need to remember that the world hates us and we are not supposed to be comfortable with them. One writer said, God's design for his redeemed people is complete separation from everything that characterizes the sinful world. We don't do what they do. We don't think like they think. We don't talk like they talk. We don't share their values. We don't borrow from their belief systems. And we don't live in the sin that they live in. Our citizenship is in heaven. And this is one of the lessons here in this particular church about a church that was failing to live godly, holy lives. A major group of people within the church was compromising Christ's testimony and diluting the purity of that particular church because of their spiritual failure. So let's dismiss by bowing in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for, again, another lesson, a story about a church that teaches us to be careful in our own lives, in our own church, about sin and realizing that it is not our responsibility as a church to be well-liked by the world around us. We want to love them. We want to be loving to them. But we do not want to compromise with them. We want to stand separated from their sin and their wickedness and present to them a separated, holy, righteous testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ so they can see there is a real difference in how they live and what they consider okay, and how we live, and what the Bible tells us true righteousness is. So help us to live holy, godly lives, and lovingly stand for the truth, and live the truth in our lives. And we'll thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen.